you guys should, I think, accept it. All right, are you on, uh, Sultan, are you in a rush for, uh, do, you, do you want us to like cut the question short after the presentation at some point? Do you have somewhere you need to be or? Oh, uh, I have time if. Yeah, so as basically, yeah, we'll see as, as long as question comes oh, in. And... We can go on forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. Yeah, that's good. The, the dry run yesterday was about 50 minutes. Um, it's perfect. Yes, yeah, all good. No, no, no very, problem. Very good timing. Yeah. Well, let, let's see if I manage to do that today. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, no, no stress. If it, if you go a little bit uh, over the clock, it's really is no, no, no problem uh, for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean. I will disappear shortly. You want to put up your uh, front slide, uh, your opening slide already, so then when when people come in, they can uh, they can see yep. the thing. Does that work? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Oh man, it's, these crawls bar are amazing. It's uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, I will, uh, so I will disappear and I will open the doors slowly and uh, yeah, you guys can, you know, chit chat, uh, Ola, you know how to do this. I and, know. Yeah, and when you see the numbers of, uh, uh, yeah, yeah uh, Zoltan, you don't, you'll, you'll have notification of people in the waiting room, just mm -hmm. please don't, don't worry about this, okay? Okay. Yeah, great. Um, and Valentin, you will, as usual, just kind of like let me know, okay, I can start and whatnot. Yeah, you aim for to... like two minutes after start, start yeah. your uh, like your uh, sets online thinking sponsor thingy, uh, mm -hmm. like two minutes after the clock, all right? Yep, okay. okay. I will, I mean, I will also have a look at the, the number of participants if, yeah. it's still, yeah. if you're still admitting the morning. Yeah. Okay, all awesome. right, cool. All right, people, okay. have fun, and Ready? I'll catch up with you guys later. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Okay. Wow. So I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, this is a very naive question because I don't know whether you listened to Valentin when he said that he's classic sedimentologist. I'm very much carbonate sedimentologist. But so this is going to be a very naive question. Anyway, how do you actually produce these most amazing figures, images, and films? Um, in in with Python, I had to say a single word. It's Python. Okay. Basically, basically Python mm -hmm. is like a you can you can convert anything to a number, mm -hmm. a bunch of numbers, and then just you know. You you can shape those numbers the way you want. Essentially, that's and there are all these packages that you you can just grab and and start using right away. So it's it's a fantastic environment. No, I I started my adventure with coding only last semester, and uh, I can't say that it went really very well. But yeah, I think maybe I will come back at some point to it. <laughs> but so. If you're using Python for coding, then you, I mean, obviously you need to take the topography that is like real, and then you just, by different, differing some parameters, you can make these, I'm sorry, it sounds really like a blasphemy, but then you can make these wonderful. Yeah, so the, I mean, obviously the image that is on the screen, that's that's actually, mm -hmm. uh, that's QGIS. Uh, yeah. Right. So, uh, but but the models themselves, those are in Python, and you just change a parameter, and it suddenly it looks quite different. And mm -hmm. um, but yeah. it, it, I mean, I I cannot recommend enough to you know do do coding a lot of it, and because it's very, it's very, it's not. You know, there is this idea that coding and mathematics are hard, and and I mean they are, but but it's not like you need to be a genius to to do it right and any anybody can do it and the results are just so amazingly gratifying i mean just looking at this what you do is is apart from the scientifically it's like really very exciting this is also just you know like visually pleasing 
So yeah, this and is really nice. But tell me, please, does it ever happen to you that you that you started with some model and suddenly your manders were completely bazinga and and you got some completely surprised and out of space results? No, that never happened. No, it, it happens every day. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I, I'm i pretty sure that this would happen to me like several times at least that I would get like- I Yeah, know. I mean, it, I, it always happens. It's, <laughs> and, and I'm not a professional programmer, so uh, uh, it happens very often, but, but, you know, you just try to figure out what went wrong and what is the parameter that you you get strong and start over again. Yeah, no, this is um, this is just very yeah, very cool stuff that you're doing, and I think that you have really a lot of fans. I'm I'm definitely not the only one. Um, yeah, I think now maybe maybe one more minute we can wait and tell me please how I honestly don't know. How long have you been doing that? Well, I've been. Um, I'm pretty sure you will mention it in today's talk somehow, but. Well, I, I've been. I started working on submarine channels. Uh, probably, uh, it, it must be uh, ten years ago at least. I think it's more than that. Like probably 2015, something like that. Okay. Um, so that's yes, that's way more than ten years. Is it? No, I no, yeah, it's not. no, that's actually less. 2015 is less. No, no, 2000, sorry, 2005. That's what I mean. Okay, that's, okay, yeah. So I started working on submarine channels, and then then that I realized that it's hard to understand submarine channels if you don't understand the rivers. So that's how I started slowly uh, to learn more about rivers. But uh, uh, only only in the last uh, you know, seven years, so I start using the Python. I think we might just very slowly start. So, hello everyone, and welcome to this week's SETS online webinar. I'm Ola Kitchen, and I talk to you from Newcastle upon Time in UK. As always, before we are starting our webinar, I would like to thank our sponsors from EIS, which allow us to offer all of these resources free of charge. And our resources include recorded lectures, learning tools, and even virtual field trips. So be sure to check our website. And our website went kind of revamped some months ago and it looks really, really great. So I definitely encourage you to check it. Our today's lecture is by Zoltan Sylvester. He has a PhD from Stanford University and has previously worked in research labs and in the energy industry. Now he's a research scientist at Bureau of Economic Geology at Jackson School of Geosciences at University of Texas at Austin in US. And he also is a co-PI of the Quantitative Classic Laboratory. And his research focuses on the geomorphology and stratigraphy of classic depositional systems. Today, Zoltan will take us to the 3D geometry of meandering channels and their implications for stratigraphic record. And just before I will give the mic to Zoltan, just one last thing before, um, the chat will be closed during the talk, but if you have any question, just either keep it in mind or write it down and we'll open a chat directly after, after the talk. And now with no more further ado, Zoltan, please, the stage is yours. Thanks, Ola, and uh, thanks for uh, all the SEDS online organizers for having me. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, meanders, something that uh, I like to talk about a lot. So probably the first half or so of the talk will be familiar to uh, uh, many of you, uh, but there is some new material towards uh, the latter half. So uh, maybe that is worth uh, waiting for. Uh, before I uh, uh, start, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators on these projects, uh, Jake Kovold, Paul Durkin, Steve Hubbard, David Morick, Indra Altman, Paul Morris, and Paul Speed. And I want to start by 
pointing out that uh, something obvious that meandering rivers are uh, very common uh, on our planet uh, and, and very important in, in many regards. Here is a digital elevation model of uh, the Gulf Coast uh, uh, in, in the US. Uh, and all these, all these valleys that you see highlighted, all these rivers uh, are essentially meandering rivers. Uh, and uh, there are also meandering channels uh, on the slope in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they are not really visible at this scale, but uh, I will talk about one that is over here in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. Uh, uh, so meandering is important uh, because uh, uh, we need to understand uh, uh, these systems uh, if we want to deal with uh, uh, floods, for example, uh, especially nowadays that uh, we don't know anymore what a 500 year flood means. Um, uh, they are important because they leave behind deposits that host uh, oil and gas uh, and water, uh, and they are increasingly of interest in terms of uh, capturing uh, carbon. Um, so what I, I, I like to do today and what I'm really interested in and has been working on so far is is what is a baseline? What is pure meandering about? So that we can then understand the departures from that, and including uh, including tides uh, and uh, and erosional uh, er variations in erodibility, uh, and uh, last but not at least uh, human influence influence like dams and increased flooding due to climate change and so on. Uh, and I'd like to motivate uh, uh, this introduction by looking at a, a short section of the White River in Arkansas. Uh, and for a long time, uh, geomorphological research on meandering has been focusing on a little bit on the question of what is the ideal meander shape. And these are beautiful shapes, so it's, it's, it's a good question. Uh, and it's also useful in the sense that you can uh, ask, you can look at uh, something like this and you can ask uh, which is the direction of the flow. And maybe you should think a little bit very quickly about that. What do you think the flow is uh, in this case? Uh, but uh, there's a very nice paper by, by Gary Parker um, where uh, they talk about this uh, uh, large uh, and, and curved uh, meander shape. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the Kinoshita shape, uh, which is asymmetric. Uh, and uh, they are suggesting here the direction of flow and also uh, suggesting that there is erosion on the upstream side and accretion on the downstream side. And you can see that that particular meander of the White River is quite similar to what uh, Parker et al. have suggested uh, in that paper. And um, uh, well, of course, Gary Parker is right, uh, somewhat unsurprisingly, uh, the flow direction is uh, from the left to right. Uh, but what, as a stratigrapher, what I'm really interested in is uh, also the history of the river. And if we only look at the plan view pattern, like I'm showing here, then we are ignoring all this rich detail uh, that you can see uh, in, in a LIDAR uh, image of the same meander bands. Uh, not to mention if you also include what's recorded in the stratigraphy. So as stratigraphers, it's, it's, uh, it's not just that the present is the key to the past, but the past is the key to the present. Uh, so if we start analyzing this image in a bit more detail, then we can paint in erosion and deposition along the banks. Uh, and uh, again, uh, Gary Parker is right. Uh, this bend has uh, a lot of erosion on the upstream side. So you see all these scroll patterns are being truncated and deposition on the downstream side. And in fact, that is true for every single bend in this image that the upstream side of the point bars is erosional and the downstream side is depositional. We can also notice that uh, compared to the invection points, so these inflection points are points of zero curvature and they define the bends. Compared to the bend itself, the, the bar, the point bar, if you look at this one, for example, does not coincide with the bend. So this point bar 
actually continues beyond the downstream termination of that band, right? So over here, I still have that position, although I already started the next band. So sometimes this creates confusion and I, I'm actually not a big fan of focusing on individual bands in, in separation. These are very dynamic systems and bands change and new bands show up. So it's always a good idea to think about the history and, and what's happening upstream as well. Another thing we can see here are all these uh, fossilized, if you want, erosional surfaces. So every uh, bend has an upstream continuation of this erosional surface. So as, as this bend is translating, that's what the white arrows signify, the downstream translations of these bends. As it's translating, uh, the erosional surface over here in a few years or maybe a few tens of years will be covered by these deposits over here, right? I will have deposition over here if this uh, dynamics persists, what we see here. Uh, so I, what I'm getting at is that uh, this kind of pattern is so common. And I, I spend probably way too much time just, just looking around in Google Earth and looking for beautiful meanders. You might have noticed that on Twitter. Um, this pattern is so common that maybe it's time to to uh, change the you know the, the this classic vision of of point bars that they are beautifully symmetric uh, simple shapes. Uh, we should switch to something like this uh, because this is uh, much more common. A combination of expansion with translation and these erosional surfaces in uh, in on that side of the bend. Uh, one last thing that I want to mention here is the beautiful uh, morphologies that come from the levee deposits. So uh, there are very nice crevasse plays on the outer banks here over there, but you also see, uh, and over here, but you also see similar deposits uh, along these uh, ancient erosional surfaces, right? Like over here, there are some nice crevasse plays and levee deposits, uh, uh, the same uh, along here, uh, also along the upstream side of the bars. So uh, there's this striking difference between the scroll patterns on the inner bank and these well-developed levees uh, on the outer bank. And one of the questions I want to look at uh, later is why is, how can we explain with a simple model these differences in, in, uh, in the overbank deposition? Uh, and there are a number of things that I want to address uh, and these are as follow, follows. Uh, first, a simple model of meandering. Then we look at the question, does it work in rivers? Uh, does it work in submarine channels? Uh, what is the impact of uh, this asymmetry that I mentioned uh, and of, of this model on the geometry of, on, of point bars, the impact on levees? Uh, talk a little bit about grading rivers. Uh, this, is, this is really new uh, material. Uh, and then finally wrap it up by uh, talking about the aggradation of submarine channels. But let's start with a simple model of meandering. Uh, and uh, just to state maybe the uh, obvious, uh, this is what, what follows is not doing justice to all the much more sophisticated and much more realistic uh, me uh, modeling work that has been done and is being done on meandering. Uh, so uh, if, if you're interested in that, I'm not the right guy to talk to. Uh, this is a very simple model, but in, in this case, I think simplicity is good because uh, it, it, it is easy to, I think it's easy to understand, to explain, uh, and it's very useful in, uh, in when you are trying to understand large scale and long-term questions about meandering, at least I hope so. So this simple model of meandering is essentially figuring out how migration relates to curvature. Can we just use curvature as a way to predict where the river is going to go next? And uh, I think the, a key paper, a classic paper, a fantastic paper uh, that started this line of thinking is Hicken and Nansen's work from 1975, where they went out and they measured 10 uh, meander bands. They dated trees uh, along these scrolls. Uh, and estimated migration rates for individual bands. And they plotted the data and it looks like this. Migration rate on the y-axis and uh, radius of curvature normalized by channel width on the x-axis. And they found that for very large bands, uh, uh, like uh, 
do, do I have seven here? No, not really. But for very large bands, uh, the migration rate is low. And that, that makes a lot of sense. It's just, if it's a large meander band, then, then the, the curvature is, is low and, and there's not a lot of uh, force pushing the river to the outer bank. So the migration is, low, is, is slow. Uh, but as we decrease uh, the radius of curvature, so the bands are becoming sharper as we come to the left, the rate of migration increases and reaches a maximum somewhere here and then it starts dropping. And this is the non-intuitive part, in my opinion. Why would uh, meandering slow down, migration slow down as uh, you are going towards sharper and sharper bends? And there's some historical reason why uh, Hicken and Enslin thought that this was, uh, this made a lot of sense. But anyway, this was the model. Uh, and it's a very influ influential way of plotting uh, migration and curvature data. It has been done on many rivers in many, many studies. I'm just gonna show one example that illustrates the problem with this kind of plot. Uh, and this is data from the Dane River. Those are the blue dots. And I have also plotted the Hicken and Nansen curve in orange. Uh, and you can see that one, the match is not very good. And second, even if it was good, if there's so much scatter, I can't really say much about migration rate as a function of curvature. All I can say is that for this range anyway, down here, anything is possible. Very high migration rates and very low migration rates. Um, and um, I think there's an ex explanation why there's uh, so much scatter, even in, in nicely meandering rivers. Uh, a related question is, uh, the question of expansion and translation. And obviously these modes of transformation of meanders uh, have been known for a while. Uh, and, and one of the ideas, and it's, it's obviously a good idea because it's observed very commonly is that translation is due to confinement. But what I want to focus on is that uh, expansion and translation are not so uh, dichotomic. It's, there is, the whole spectrum in between and purely expansional meanders are quite rare. Uh, and this simple model that I'm talking about explains uh, that idea uh, pretty well. So let's start this uh, thought experiment uh, where we take two bands with the same radius of curvature. Uh, and this is a, an idea that uh, David John Furbish published a long time ago. Uh, and so here are two bands. Uh, let me jump back for a second. Uh, and they, they have the same radius of curvature, right? Uh, these cur circles are the same. The difference is that uh, this one wraps around for longer uh, than that one. Uh, and so if you think about driving around these two bands, intuitively you know that, or, or from experience, you know that this is gonna be a more dangerous curve than that one, right? Be and and the, the key word here is momentum, right? It matters when you are at this point, it matters uh, how much uh, curvature is behind you, upstream from you, if you want. So a uh, simplest possible model of meandering would be that migration is simply a function of uh, local curvature, right? If we think about centrifugal force, that's a linear function of local curvature. So uh, uh, we could come up with this uh, a simple equation, uh, an attempt to, to model meandering, right? So let's see what happens if we apply this uh, to, to uh, these two bends, uh, there are the migration vectors, which are the same as the curvature vectors, right? Uh, note that uh, this is a very sudden change in curvature here. Actually, if you look at road design, roads are not designed like this because uh, it would be, the change here for a car would be too big. So they, they actually ease the curve uh, in the straight line into the curve. I forgot what's the term for that. Um, so if we look at these vectors, we see that high migration rates coincide with high curvatures, that's fine. And average migration rates are the same in the two bands. Uh, but uh, this doesn't work. So the, the, what, what actually works, if I come back to this, is that, uh, as I was suggesting before, that the, what happened upstream from you uh, matters. How much curve have you taken before? Because of the momentum, it matters. So, uh, 
essentially, if you if you distill down the the everything into a kinematic thing, then you come up with this idea that migration is the weighted sum of upstream curvature. So if we plot the vectors uh, along those two circles, this way we get a very different uh, image. Uh, and I'm going to stop it here for a second. So the the longer curve. Uh, again, the curvatures are the same here, but the longer band uh, has a different pattern of uh, migration and also the migration, the maximum migration is gonna be shifted downstream simply because I have a lot of high curvature values from here that are uh, uh, coming into the equation when I'm calculating the migration rate over here. So in this second scenario, uh, which is the correct scenario, or about correct scenario, high migration rates are on the downstream side and the average migration rates are not the same in the two bands. Yet that was the expectation in the Hicken and Nansen approach that they should be because uh, the curvatures are the same. So uh, Howard and Knudsen wrote a paper where they explored this idea, uh, this kinematic model where migration rate is the upstream, uh, uh, is the weighted sum of upstream curvatures. And this is what I show here. Here is a meander band, red is curvature vectors, blue is migration vectors. Uh, and if we flatten this uh, like that, then we get a plot of the two functions as a, as a, as a, uh, as a function of a long channel distance. Uh, and in this model, what you end up with is that the migration curve, which is the blue one again, is shifted downstream. So there is this lag between the two. Uh, and otherwise the curves are similar, but, uh, but there is a lag. And this is a very characteristic feature of meandering recognized by a lot of people long time ago, um, especially modelers. So if uh, we plot migration as a function of curvature like this, without taking into account the lag, we get something like this. And now we take the absolute value of uh, curvature and migration rate that is usually done. And we end up like, like this. And to reproduce the Hicken and Nansen plot or something similar, we need to take the radius of curvature. So there is that characteristic shape that I showed before from actual data. But if we take the lag into account, as I think we should, then we get something like this. Uh, so the two curves are quite similar. So we end up with a quasi linear relation between the two. Uh, and uh, this emphasizes the, the difference between the two ways of plotting the same data. And I think this way of doing it is, is much more useful because you have a more predictable relation between the two. So we can uh, take this model. It's even a little bit simpler than what Howard and Knudsen published. Uh, and uh, we wrote a, a little package in Python that is available uh, on GitHub if you're interested in playing with it. Uh, and here is a, a, a stratigraphic display of a long-term uh, meander evolution. Uh, you can also mimic uh, very simply what happens if old point bars and outbulls are covered up uh, by vegetation. Uh, and also there is, this includes a way to generate 3D models, which I'm gonna show uh, uh, a little bit later. But let's move on. The question is, does this simple model work in rivers? And we tried to answer that question by looking at uh, seven rivers in the Amazon basin. This is one of the few places on earth uh, where uh, human influence, at least on rivers, is limited. Uh, so they are you know, beautiful, natural meandering rivers, uh, mostly. Uh, and we looked at 1,600 uh, bends. Uh, here is an example. Here are not 94 from the Jura River. And blue is curvature. Uh, green is migration rate, and note the similarity of the two curves. So it's it's uh, uh, it's it's striking, and you see the, the uh, this this uh, oblique lines between the two is basically due to the lag, the spatial lag between the two. Uh, and so, long story short, uh, we found that this relation holds pretty well uh, for better for some rivers than others. Uh, but uh, uh, there are lots of data points uh, and there are some interesting questions and, and Alvisa Finotello and others wrote, wrote a comment in geology pointing out this, this uh, flattening of the curve as you go to high curvatures. 
And, and I, I agree that's a good point that there is more research to be done here, uh, but I, I think more data uh, is needed to see what exactly is going on and, and more modeling, maybe more careful modeling. In any case, uh, the next logical question is, does it work in summary channels? And the short answer is it does, uh, but this is preliminary work. Uh, here is a, a seismic image uh, from the Bengal fan. Uh, and to me, it's remarkable how organized these meanders are and these scrolls are. Uh, and you would have a hard time uh, telling, saying that this is not the Mississippi River if somehow you could convert it into a, a Google Earth-like uh, image. Uh, and to, to emphasize that a little bit more, here is uh, an animation from the Ucayali River in Peru using Landsat data, and we can plot the center lines through time. The patterns are extremely similar to what you see in this particular set of bands from the Bengal fan. Uh, but of course, you want to quantify this. And uh, uh, one of the students who work uh, with us uh, on this uh, uh, looked at uh, this channel in, from the eastern Gulf of Mexico and generated uh, similar plots, uh, migration distance. In this case, we cannot really measure the migration rate because we then don't have precise ages. So we plot distance, but the migration distance has a quasi-linear relation to uh, curvature. Um, so uh, these this, this preliminary results suggest that even uh, you know, quantitatively speaking, land view migration styles of submarine channels are similar to rivers. Um, in the next uh, short section, uh, I want to talk about uh, the impact on point bars. Uh, and in the sense that point bars uh, are not just point bars, but also counter point bars. But first, let's zoom in a little bit uh, 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 to see the, the patterns of velocity and shear. And this is a very nice numerical model output from 1989, uh, where the blues are uh, the channel bathymetry, uh, and you can see where the point bars are, uh, and the arrows represent the boundary shear stress at the bottom of the river. Uh, and the red line shows the line of highest shear stress, the maximum shear stress. And again, you see this asymmetry that is due to, to the momentum of the flow. And one thing that is very obvious here is that point bars suffer a lot of shear on their upstream side and not much shear on the downstream side. So if grain size is a function is of boundary shear stress, and it should be, then point bars tend to be coarser grained on the upstream side than on the downstream side. Uh, and and in, that's indeed what we observe. And if the, the curvature of these bands changes, uh, I think the contrast between the two is even more significant. Uh, and there is, uh, there is this uh, really nice paper that just came out in geomorphology where uh, Corey Consors group uh, from LSU uh, gathered this bathymetry data from the Pearl River. And you see similar patterns with the point bars being asymmetric, a little bit downstream from the point of maximum curvature and extending beyond the, the inflection point. Uh, one of the groups that has studied, uh, especially from a sediment logic point of view, uh, has studied these uh, extensions, downstream extensions of point bars uh, uh, is Daryl Smith's group. Uh, uh, at the University of Calgary uh, and uh, Steve Hubbard and Paul Durkin has, has uh, uh, taken up the challenge to continue this work. Uh, and uh, uh, Daryl Smith went out and took some cores and he found that, that um, if you look at uh, this core over here, it shows a nice point bar succession, right? Uh, nice finding up lots of sand. Uh, but if you move downstream uh, to what uh, they call the concave bank over here, there's a lot of silt and mud. So very atypical of, uh, of the classic point bar. And uh, this is of course very far from any tidal influence. So if we paint in the so-called counterpoint bar or sometimes these are called concave bank deposits and the point bar, this is how it would look like. Uh, and one of the questions is, is the way to quantify this difference and basically Basically, tell uh, you know where I should expect the development of these mud-rich or silt-rich deposits, uh, and the answer is simple: uh, it's concave bank deposition. So deposition means that there is 
migration in this direction, right? Uh, and concave mean, mean, means that curvature is pointing the other way than on the point bar. So if we look at the migration and curvature vectors, they are pointing in the same direction on the point bar and opposite directions on the counter point bar. And if we want to uh, combine these into a single parameter, then we can take the product of the two and this will be a negative number and that will be a positive number. So uh, we call that the bar type index uh, and uh, that's how we want to characterize counterpoint bars. So here is an animation of this idea, uh, curvature again, and migration rate, uh, curvature, migration rate. Uh, and then if you take up the product, you come up with the bar type index. And uh, the bar type index is negative, uh, where you expect counterpoint bars, right, in these places. Uh, and one thing you can observe here is that uh, this is a very important mechanism in short uh, bands, relatively small bands, and large mature bands like this one are relatively unaffected, partly because there's not much migration anyway. But uh, the main reason is that the lag between curvature and migration rate is relatively constant along the same river segment. And it's relatively small in a big band like this, but pretty large uh, when, when you are in a band like this. And these are the bands, as you can see from the, uh, from the migration, you could see from the migration arrows, I'm not gonna go back. These are the bands that really translate downstream, these small, smaller, younger bands. Um, so we went back to the Mamore River in Bolivia and uh, did some analysis of Landsat imagery and we labeled, we painted all the uh, deposits that were left behind by the river uh, according to this bar type index. And the way these uh, short uh, and, and unusual bands are generated or out of equilibrium bands are generated is some kind of perturbation. Like this is a cutoff, which is not a simple neck cutoff. And you can see how this band over here goes from expansion to sudden translation and very strong translation. So all these blues here are likely to be counterpoint bar because it's probably uh, quite heterolytic. A lot more of this is going on in this other segment of the Mamore. There's a big neck cutoff here. Again, strong translation right after the cutoff. So expansion, expansion, nice point bars and boom, boom. Uh, uh, there it goes, the, the counterpoint bar. Uh, so I mentioned this question, why do we have, uh, in terms of levy deposits, why there is such a difference between the outer bank and the scroll bars on the inner bank? And uh, momentum and obviously has to play a role in this, but uh, the other uh, important factor is, is uh, essentially the rate of migration uh, and how that impacts uh, the levies. And I want to go back to this paper. It's actually a relatively recent paper by one of uh, David Morick's students, uh, Jasmine Mason. Uh, and they went to the Trinity River uh, here in Texas uh, and they looked at uh, these scroll bars and not just using LIDAR image, they dug a lot of trenches. Uh, and they pointed out these that these one, the, 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 the elevations of these scrolls are pretty, high, so uh, these deposits actually can make up a significant chunk of the total bar deposit, if you want. Uh, but more importantly, uh, they are saying that scroll bars are inner bank levees along meandering river beds. Uh, and I really like that because it's simple and it, it almost has to be true. Um, and if we want to try to model this, uh, and, and I, I have to admit the, the what I have used before for overbank deposition in meander pie, it's, it's a very, very naive way of modeling levees to put it nicely. So I started uh, thinking about how to do this better. And of course, if, if you read carefully, then it turns out that Alan Howard did it and did it uh, uh, very well. And uh, here is the equation that he used. And this is based on some work done by James Pizzuto before, where he showed that uh, coarser suspended sediment settles out uh, as a function of distance from the closest channel uh, uh, according to a diffusion law. So you have this exponential function, basically, that this is the most important bit here. Uh, and then this term essentially says how low uh, 
is the elevation at the point I'm standing on uh, relative to a maximum elevation. So if you're in the middle of, the, of an Oxbow Lake, then this number is pretty high. So the deposition rate is gonna be high. So the beauty of this is that it takes care of things like uh, filling an Oxbow Lake, as you will see hopefully soon. Uh, and, and Howard has, has made these nice uh, simulations a long time ago where he was changing the overbank deposition rate and so on. And all I want to do here is to explore this model a little bit more in, in three dimensions. So let's look at a fluvial model, uh, which only has lateral migration. So there is no incision, no aggradation, just pure lateral migration, right? And to give you a sense of scale here, this is 200 meters wide and uh, six meters deep, right? Probably a, not a bad size from a, an average river. Uh, so let's look uh, at what happens if I, if I start meandering this. Uh, and what I did here is uh, I added a bit of variability in, the, in that maximum height, which essentially is, is what I'm changing is the severity of the flooding, right? So there are larger, somewhat larger floods and somewhat smaller floods. And that's how you get this uh, nice scroll pattern. Uh, and I think this looks pretty natural. Uh, and uh, you can start thinking about how the scroll patterns correlate from one band to the other. Uh, for example, you can see that there is this darker band here that at the, the edge of each point bar. And that's because there was a set of relatively low stages, uh, low floods uh, towards the end of the succession that I, uh, I used as an input. So let me run this again, because it's kind of fun to watch it. Uh, one thing to note here is that so these scrolls are, as, as Mason and Morick said, these are just building as, as inner levees. Uh, and then you have these uh, uh, outer levee deposits, uh, which basically they are not very long lasting issue. I mean, they are always there, but they are just because the nature of the migration, they are, they are being eroded all the time. This would be more significant if you included some kind of a term to account for uh, the curvature effect on the levy deposits, right? And I'm, I'm definitely not doing that. Uh, what I think this also captures relatively well is that whenever you have a, a bank exposed for a longer time to uh, like, it's near a channel, like these uh, uh, erosional surfaces, uh, like this one here or that one there, you see there's more white, there's higher elevations. And that's because the channel has been migrating along that surface. So it has time to deposit levees. And we saw that in the White River image. And we can slice and dice these models like you see here to better understand the stratigraphy. To me, that's, that's very important. Uh, it's, uh, I, I spent a lot of time working on this and I, I'm still surprised when, when I start uh, doing these, these uh, cross sections. But uh, let's, let's explore uh, this idea that uh, if I have a, an input, uh, a, basically a discharge uh, as input or a water stage uh, as input, uh, and this is totally artificial, of course, I'm just modeling uh, larger and smaller floods uh, uh, for a number of years, uh, then I can look at how this is reflected in the point bar uh, if I take a, a, a cross section. Uh, and the answer is that uh, this, I mean, I'm, maybe I'm stating the obvious, but it, it kind of it kind of acts as a as a recording tape of uh, of the of the flood history of the river and the 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 equivalence is not one to one so what what you can really see in this very vertically exaggerated profile here which is just the top of the brown stuff here uh, you can see that very large clusters of floods like this one are reflected as a well defined ridge right uh, but those deposits might cover up the, you know, the, the exact magnitude of the floods in, in what's before. But again, this is super preliminary, not very well calibrated, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting line of research that we want to pursue further. Uh, now, in order to get these nice, well-defined scroll bars when you only have later lateral migration, I had to uh, do a trick. I had to restrict the, the amount of diffusion away from the channel, because otherwise the scroll gets the scrolls gets covered up uh, uh, by, uh, by later uh, levee deposits. Uh, but this changes 
so, so here is a here is an example. I increased the length diffusion length scale from here to here, and you see how everything kind of gets white. Um, one way to uh, avoid that, if you wish, and, and in nature as well, I think is that if you had a very small amount of incision, I think this is just like one meter of incision during all this time. Uh, so if I go from this to this, the same exact parameters, and you see how the scroll definition increases suddenly because the river is incising uh, and that elevation, um, uh, you know, the, the flood waters can only get so high uh, when you have incision and one meter uh, difference matters in a river, especially if you have a house close to it. Uh, so, and you can, you can do this further. So here's the, the original and then incision, even more incision. And these, these scrolls become uh, even better defined. But what about aggradation? So we have long known that submarine channels love to aggrade, partly because uh, they aggrade so much that uh, these uh, patterns are beautifully visible uh, in, uh, in seismic data, three-dimensional seismic data, and Mark Deptock has done a lot of uh, pioneering work to, to show how this happens. Uh, and here are some cross sections. And uh, Zane Job and others have nicely documented the difference between submarine channels and fluvial channels. So the dark gray lines here are all uh, channel trajectories, if you wish, like uh, uh, taking a line like this for that particular example, starting from here and going up, right? So uh, dark gray lines are submarine channels and these, these uh, lighter gray lines are fluvial systems. And they made the point that uh, submarine channels aggrade so much more than rivers do. Uh, so in the case of submarine channels, uh, I, I think it's obvious how they aggrade, they just, uh, deposit a lot of levees, but rivers are great as well. I mean, if it's, there's maybe only a few meters here difference, but a few meters of aggradation in the river, it, it does matter. And, and I don't think there are many studies uh, that actually show how this happens. Uh, but if you look at uh, the stratigraphic record, here is a nice example from uh, the Morrison Formation in Utah. Uh, this is an, an outcrop that, uh, uh, Adrian Hartley and uh, Amanda Owen uh, have, have been studying. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful example of several meander bands. And the one I want to focus on is this one. If you see my cursor, uh, nice flow patterns here. Flow direction is upwards towards the north. Uh, and if you look closely, uh, this ridge is actually fairly standing very high above, uh, the, above the scrolls over here. Uh, and also if you walk from here to over there, you are walking uphill. So there are several meters uh, of elevation difference. And I think that's because of uh, aggradation. So we know that fluvial systems must aggrade. Uh, and obviously here, the, all the mud has been eroded. Uh, so we don't know how it exactly looked like. Uh, one thing to notice here is that the reason why this ridge is so prevalent over here and not so much over there is that th this band is also migrating downstream uh, uh, and therefore you end up with uh, this pattern. As, as you will see, in, especially in the submarine examples, this is very obvious. It's aggradation combined with downstream translation, what we are looking at. Um, there are beautiful aggradational meanders on Mars. And here is one example. You can see again the same pattern where the upstream limb of the meander uh, is, uh, is a ridge compared to the scrolls next to it. And that difference is not that obvious on the downstream side. Uh, this is from the uh, Eberswalde uh, crater, uh, one of the nicest meanders on Mars. But this data is, is amazing. The resolution from the high rise imagery is, is, is stunning. Uh, <clears throat> But these grading rivers exist uh, in, you know, in, in the modern as well. And here is uh, uh, John Schwartz has been studying the Rio Grande in, in West Texas uh, for a while for his PhD thesis. And, and he showed me some of this imagery, uh, uh, LIDAR imagery. And one of the striking things about the Rio Grande is that one of the reasons I never looked at it before uh, is that uh, it doesn't have schools. It's, far from the beauty of the Mississippi or the White River or the Trinity. Uh, so why does it happen? Uh, and I think it happens because this pretty much looks like a submarine channel. It's aggradational and the levees cover up uh, uh, everything. And if you try to model this, you actually need 
you know, the model won't work if you don't add enough mud to support uh, the uh, aggradation. So here is an example where I'm aggrading this channel just a little bit. It's not a lot. It's not like a submarine channel. Uh, I think it's maybe 1.5 meters in this case, the whole amount of aggradation, but that's enough. In order to sustain that, I need to increase that diffusion length scale enough that uh, I end up on one hand, I'm supporting the channel, so I need a fairly thick levy on this side as well. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm covering up the scroll pattern. So this, this is a little bit like what we see in the Rio Grande. The other interesting thing is that, that the, the Oxbow lakes tend to, up, tend to fill up pretty quickly, as you can see here. And these patterns are, are quite natural, uh, as I will show that in, in just a second. But I want to simulate this uh, so that you can see the stratigraphy as well. Uh, just a nice way of showing how the, the point bars are forming, uh, migrating in different directions, and there are cutoffs and lots of downstream translation. And if we zoom in, so this is a strike section now, flow is from the right to left. Uh, we see these uh, 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 point bars migrating mostly downstream, sometimes upstream, like there's a little bit here, but statistically speaking, again, in these models, and I think in nature as well, the downstream migration is, is extremely common. And you can zoom in even further. And here is a nice example of how those erosional surfaces related to downstream uh, translation look like. This is how you would expect them uh, to look like. Uh, there is the erosional surface, and then it's the direction of migration is away from it. And you see nicely see how the, the oxbows are filling up. This side is more filled than that side because it's close to this uh, channel. Uh, and here is an animation that shows a similar style of oxbow filling. Like you can look at this oxbow here, how it gets filled as the channel gets closed. Um, there is another one here uh, and so on. I, I think the, the large scale patterns are, are, are quite similar. And we have arrived to the last subject, uh, uh, and that is a grading submarine channels. And as I said, the, the question in, in the submarine channel uh, world is not so much how they are grade, uh, it, the question is why they are grade. Because so rivers, in the case of rivers, why there is incision or aggradation, often it's, the, the answer is very simple. If you decrease the base level, that leads to incision. Uh, if you start grading, uh, start raising the, the base level, then the river either is able to uh, keep up and the grade, or uh, it gets flooded, uh, right? It gets, it disappears. It, um, but in the submarine channels, case of submarine channels, there is no obvious reason why a channel should go from incision to aggradation. There's no clear base level in the case of submarine channels. So why, why does it happen? Uh, but before that, I want to, show an example of, so here I forced the aggradation, right? It's the same channel pattern, but I just changed a little bit the morphology so that uh, the, the details, so that it's more fitting for a submarine channel. Uh, and I put a lot more aggradation uh, as we expect in the case of submarine channels, but there are lots of similarities with rivers. The, it's like an expanded stratigraphic section uh, from a river, like you vertically stretch it pretty much. and and. I know there, you know, if you go to an outcrop, I, I do not deny that if you go to an outcrop, there are tons of differences. You know, you look at these deposits from a turbidite system, very different from a fluvial system, needless to say. But that doesn't mean that at the large scale, at this scale, the similarities are not numerous. Uh, and uh, let's look at the deep section here. Uh, flow is right to left. Uh, and again, you see this downstream migration uh, of, the, of the channel sands. But in this case, because there is lots of aggradation, uh, you can see the, these trajectories uh, uh, very clearly, again, strongly downstream oriented. And uh, one of the interesting things here is that you see that these trajectories are quite flatter, still climbing and still downstream, but they are flatter. And the reason for the flatness is that these bends are migrating fast. They are high curvature, relatively young bands, and they are migrating much faster. So the, the, the climb angle has changed. And you might say, well, that's a stretch. I, I really don't see that much bias in the downstream direction in, in submarine channels. 
But if we look at this Joshua Channel that I mentioned before, we are in the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. This is a beautiful system. Uh, and, and there's a, a, an amazing 3D seismic data set that Jake Kovalt and Paul Morris uh, have been working on. And if you look at the cross section, that is a deep section running like this. Uh, that's how it looks like. There is the base of the system. And again, if you look at these channel trajectories, uh, we see the bias for uh, downstream migration. Uh, um, the vast majority of these are, are aggrading, uh, highly aggrading, but also migrating downstream, exactly what we would expect from that simple model. And we can, we can look at the, the evolution of the system more carefully because it's so aggravational that it's a little bit like looking at Landsat imagery through time. And this is, these are maps that Jake has generated going from the bottom to the seafloor. Sinuosity increases a lot. Uh, and uh, Paul Morris has uh, uh, made an effort to, to map all the center lines, uh, well, not all, but a lot of center lines uh, from this system so that uh, he can look in more detail. Uh, and that's what he did. So he made this plot of sinuosity alongside aggradation. And aggradation in this case is just the, the average elevation of the channel through time. So this is a proxy for time. Uh, and you can see that both of them increase, overall increase uh, uh, through time. Uh, and the question arises, is there a causal relationship between the two? Uh, so we started thinking about this and I think the answer is yes. So the sinuosity basically is driving the aggradation. The change in sinuosity is driving the aggradation. So how does that work? If I go from an initial center line like this and uh, I go to a, a highly sinuous channel, then it means that I'm increasing sinuosity through time. So that's the, the orange curve. Uh, the only way I can do this is that I in, decrease the slope through time. So this line, the dashed line has to have higher slope because the other line is longer, right? And I'm getting from the same point uh, to the same point. Uh, so it's a geometric necessity that slope goes down through time. And now I say, well, we know that turbidity currents are extremely sensitive to slope. So maybe when I start out two degrees, uh, it's, that's a pretty steep slope. So I probably have erosion, but I start decreasing the slope as the sinuosity goes up. So maybe I reach a point, maybe over here, where the slope is steep enough that there is bypass. Nothing is happening. Uh, and beyond that point, I start aggrading, start depositing in the channel, right? So I have incision uh, and aggradation uh, from that point on. And this is an actual model output. So you see how it incises first and then it goes to aggradation without actually forcing that aggradation. Just because I input this condition, it's basically a, a modified stream power law, which includes deposition, right? Here it's just simple erosion, but here I added a, a, a term that goes positive. Uh, if you cross this bypass threshold. So the curve shapes here, the orange and this are similar to what uh, Paul has found uh, in, in the Joshua channel. And this is the same, um, the same model through time, starting with a bit of incision uh, over here and then aggradation with an increasing rate. Uh, let that play one more time. And Paul has started measuring the, the, um, the slope uh, actually along this system because it's supposed to be uh, decreasing through time and his results uh, seem to confirm what we expect, that slope is decreasing through time. So uh, that's basically the end of it. Uh, if uh, there are two main ideas I want you to take from this. Uh, one is this idea of autogenic downstream translation, which is common in meandering systems, both rivers and, and uh, submarine channels. And they result in these erosional surfaces like, like these guys over here, which should be common in the stratigraphic record. They result in counterpoint bars, which should also be common in the stratigraphic record. And uh, we should also think about the effects of combined aggradation and translation in terms of three-dimensional geometry. Uh, and the second idea is how all this links to the morphology and stratigraphy of levees. Uh, the idea that scroll bars are inner levees, uh, as uh, Mason and Morick suggested, uh, and that more continuous and longer term, uh, they form a more continuous longer term record than outer bank levees. 
Uh, and also, if you start the grading even a little bit, that uh, prevents uh, uh, geomorphologic scroll formation, if you want. Thank you. I forgot to include uh, this uh, thank you slide. Uh, so most of our work is supported by a number of companies and institutions, and I'm also grateful for remote sensing data from USGS and Planet and uh, a lot of open source software uh, without which this would not be possible. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Zoltan, for this amazingly fantastic presentation. It was really very visual and I enjoyed it very much. And um, I think I particularly actually enjoyed the fact that you didn't only explain how it works, but actually like physically showed it. So I, I liked it really very much. And uh, yes, just uh, I see that there are no questions in the chat as yet. I think that the people are probably still typing. Please don't be shy. Uh, there's your chance to ask a question. But also please remember once you will be asking a question to write where you're watching us from. And waiting for the questions from the audience, I think I can ask my question. Um, the time scales. I'm always fascinated by the time scales because the rivers, I think that rivers are such a dynamic environment. And then you have showed the slide with, uh, um, I think it was the flood magnitude and the time scale that you showed was like, I think 120 years or 130 years, but how actually, yeah. So where do you take this time scale from and from- Brian. Or how do you think, can it sometimes evolve slowly or faster? Yeah, what's what's your feeling for the time scale? Well, so if, if you look at the data from modern rivers, uh, some of them are are migrating extremely fast. Um, so in, in some of these rivers in, in South America, they, they uh, you know, maximum migration rates are like 60 meters or even 80 meters per year. Um, which is geologically speaking is is lightning fast uh, and and other rivers are uh, migrating much slower right but even even slowly migrating rivers are geologically speaking fast so what we see in the stratigraphic record when you see a meandering river for example uh, it, it's uh, it was probably deposited in a, in a very short time frame it's just the lucky bit that was preserved, especially if you don't have much subsidence. Uh, uh, there is, uh, um, you know, what, what you see preserved is just the last, you know, last 200 years or last 2000 years, which is still not much geologically speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, but so ideally, uh, you know, you, you, and I haven't done that much, uh, a lot of these models on the scale are on the scale of, a few hundred years or maybe a few thousand years. Um, and I haven't thought much about the deep time aspects of this um, because that would require even longer term modeling. But yes, that's that's a good question. Yeah, thank you. So wait a minute. I think I may dwell on it a little bit longer, but first we have a question from our own Valentin asking from Oslo. Cheers for the super presentation, Zoltan. The relationship you have shown between decreasing slope and increasing sinuosity in deep water channels. Does the same relationship exist in river channels? And as in, do you have the same threshold? Um, in theory, it, I mean, the, the, that concept that uh, as you increase sinuosity, you are decreasing the slope, that idea has to be true, regardless of whether you are in submarine or uh, fluvial system. Um, I'm not sure it's as important in rivers as it is, as it is in, in submarine channels because uh, in, in uh, and this is pretty much pure speculation what, what comes now, but uh, first the, the slopes are much lower in rivers anyway, um, but also the, the 
the amount of base level influence is, I think, is more important in rivers than this effect. But I, I haven't thought carefully about this. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a good good and tough question. And I don't know in terms of the whether it's the same threshold or not. I don't even know what's the threshold in the submarine uh, channels. Uh, so again, it's it's um, work work to do. Thank you. The, the next question is from Sarah, watching us from New York. And on the same presentation, have you looked into the scale of downstream phases changes in submarine versus fluvial systems in your model? Um, sorry, I was. Okay. Scale, downstream okay. phases changes. Downstream phases changes. No, I have not. Uh, uh, as, as you could see, a lot of this work is focusing on on, um, on the scale of few bands, right? Uh, partly for because it's it, these models quickly become very large. Um, so the short answer is no. Uh, but it, it's something that would be obviously a good idea to look into. All right. The next question is from Eric, uh, watching us from uh, in Houston. How does the variation in the positional time scale between fluvial, short, and deep water, much longer between flows, influence the differences we see? Well, if I think, um, I, I think. So, so I think some of some deep water systems uh, might be uh, almost as active as as uh, rivers are. Um, you know, the 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 monitoring work that is being done on, on Montre Canyon and uh, and uh, uh, Congo Canyon um, by uh, Pete Tolling and others is shows that there are lots of turbidity currents. And in my mind, they are just like big floods on a river. Like if you go out to Trinity, there is not much going on when it's not flooding. Uh, and there is a lot happening. That's when there is action, when there is flooding. So in that sense, they are not that different. But even if you had, let's say, in a submarine channel, you had only, only a big turbidity current in, in a thousand years, the only impact of that would be that you expand the time scale, right? It's still, it, the, I, I, it doesn't really change the, the geometry or the architecture, uh, I think. Okay, I can also remind you, please, dear audience, remember to send a message to everybody and not necessarily to me or to sedimentology. So I will read the question from Ross, watching us from Ontario. Very interesting talk, thank you. Do you see applications for this to modern systems, for example, to land use planning and flood prevention? Um, I think this is right now very, very relevant question, thinking about what happened lately that last week in Germany. For example, yes, uh, yes exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, uh, just uh, understanding uh, again. Uh, you know, you could, for for, uh, as far as I understand, for um, flood studies, uh, the the most important thing is having a digital elevation model, right? Uh, and that makes a lot of sense. But I think there is. Uh, you can derive insights from trying to understand the history of an incised valley, for example, uh, and, and see how much incision there has been and, and not, just, not just look at the last frame in the movie, but uh, try to look back what happened in the past. Uh, and, in, and now I'm kind of stating the obvious that if you look at the records, uh, the, the older deposits, then Maybe you can, you know, like I was talking about scroll bars and, and the, the scroll morphology, maybe there are ways to extract information about past flooding, um, you know, that, that we can use to predict future flooding. Although, you know, the past is not the key to the present anymore as, uh, as we can see in these extreme events. 
Uh, next question comes from Roberto from Hull in UK, I think. Thanks, Zoltan. Beyond the gradation, which is a key difference in most cases, do submarine channels tend to behave more like alluvial rivers or bedrock rivers? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure what's the answer, Roberto. Um, it, it, I, so I, as I said, uh, I think the plan view patterns are, are extremely similar. Um, and I also said that if you, if you zoom in, if you look at an outcrop of a submarine channel, it looks, uh, it looks very different from a, an outcrop from, of a cross-bedded fluvial system, for sure. Um, does it behave more like alluvial or bedrock? Uh, I think it's it's if I if I had to choose between the two, I think it's more like alluvial rivers because you in most uh, you know nice meandering submarine channels. The only reason you you uh, have meandering is that uh, you have a lot of sediment, so you can aggrade and and uh, there are some incisional uh, submarine channels that are also meandering, but uh, at least they are not the ones that we commonly look at, right? Um, I, I hope that answers uh, at least part of your question. Next question is from Kate from El Paso. And she asks, how does the bigger the positional setting of the channel system affect a gradational pattern? For instance, submarine fan overall setting and megafan fluvial setting of Morrison are aggradational versus fluvial channel only. And great talk. Yes, uh, that's... That's a good good question. Uh, I think, yeah, in, in the case of, uh, uh, and I, I'm just thinking aloud now, uh, this is a, a very good point. Uh, in, in the case of a, a, a mega fan setting like the, the, the Morrison um, formation, um, it, in many ways, that is similar to a large uh, turbidite fan. Uh, and you might see the aggradation, not because uh, there is a, a lake or sea nearby that, uh, that which has been the level of that has been increasing. It's, it's, it might be because of similar mechanism that we see on a, on a turbidite fan. So in, in that setting, actually coming back, somebody was asking, question before, uh, whether rivers can create following a similar mechanism to, to what I described for some channels. So in those cases, actually, that might be a, a valid mechanism to think about that, that you go from straight-ish channels, uh, higher slope to sinuous channels, uh, uh, lower slope, and therefore you grade. Uh, and I mean, in order to make a big fan, you need deposition. So aggradation has to be there somewhere. I know that's not a very useful explanation though. Okay, dear audience, are there really no more questions? Please don't be shy. If there are no more questions, I maybe ask my one, which is again, I'm, I'm sorry, my questions are always a little bit naive. Um, you mentioned the, the meanders on Mars. I don't think that I have actually seen them before, but I was also wondering, especially in context of this, what you said right now, how do physical processes of, of um, producing these meanders or Mars might differ from these that we know from Earth? Or would you expect, yeah, so I was just fascinated actually to see. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yes, I mean, uh, I, I'm not an expert in this by any means, and there's a lot of interest uh, in obviously in this, uh, and and so gravity is is smaller on is is not as powerful on Mars as is here. So so a lot of the uh, mechanics uh, you expect it to be somewhat different, uh, and I haven't again haven't thought much about uh, how exactly. Uh, but, uh, you know, qualitatively looking, um, uh, and I, 
I don't think anyone has done yet the, you know, the curvature migration measurements that, that I was showing here, um, as far as I know. But qualitatively, if you look at these meanders, they look, they look extremely similar to what we see on Earth. Uh, it's uh, just, you know, you might as well be in Utah when you uh, look at these images. It's, it's just better outcrop because, because there is no vegetation, nothing. It's just all outcrop. And again, those images are so nice that you can see the boulders in, in many cases. Yeah, there, there is something in it definitely that you can see it so clearly. I was, it might be that I was under completely wrong impression, but I was thinking that somehow meandering rivers are in a certain way related to veget area with vegetation. That if you don't have vegetation, you will probably end up with more anostomosing river than a, than a meandering one. And, and that's why I think I was also so surprised to see meanders on Mars where I don't expect vegetation. But yeah, so this, this is a very active discussion um, <laughs> in the planetary science community. Uh, yes, there was this idea, there is this idea that you need vegetation for proper meandering to exist. But I mean, I showed, I think, a nice example of submarine meandering where there is no vegetation, so it's more more a matter of uh, bank cohesion than just vegetation. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, there is beautiful meandering on Mars, uh, and uh, you know there are, there's a lot of work being done, like people like uh, uh, Mathieu uh, Lapotre and and others, Alessandro Yelpi. Uh, they are doing a lot of interesting work along these lines. No. Yeah, I think this is this is something very new, but also something a, a general topic to which your work can be very nicely applied, at least for testing different hypotheses. Mm, yeah, I see that there are no more questions in the chat. I'm pretty sure it's just because of the, you know, summer heat and the weather probably, or at least in Europe, the weather is right now in some parts is very nice. Um, so yes. Zoltan, thank you. Thank you very much for this absolutely amazing talk. And dear audience, um, next week, the same time, the same place, um, Neil Davies from University of Cambridge will be talking about the substrates, the inevitable preservation of human time scale snapshots on ancient bedding planes. So please join us next week. And thank you very much for your participation. Zoltan, again, thank you so much for your contribution. And please just Stay for a moment. I think that the rest of the team would like to chime in. Thank you, Ola. <laughs> Thank, thanks, everybody. Thank you.